Now, we'll go over uh, a little bit what we did yesterday as a brush up. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, so, we talked about experiment design and bind problems. So, let us go to the basic binding problem. It's like you have a bunch of machines you want to play with and you're going to make lots of money. If you knew the best machine, you could just maximize your amount of money, but you don't, so you have to explore all the machines. That's the basic idea. And it's a type of optimization problem where you never observe the value of the function. You can see it like that. And it has many applications in online advertising, clinical trials, etc. Okay. Now, what we looked at specifically was the stochastic bandit problem, where at time step t you take an action, a t, and you observe a reward, r t, and you want to maximize the sum of rewards over time in expectation. Okay. Now, the problem right now is not well defined because uh, the expectation has to be defined with respect to some probability measure and we haven't said what it's going to be, it's unknown. So the classical Bayesian idea is to look at the probability measure defined by your belief. Yeah. That means averaging over all possible probability measures uh, of the environment. Yeah. So it's in principle possible to solve this problem uh, through the principle of uh, backwards induction. Yeah. So this is the problem we going to solve, basically. Have a belief about the utility and the belief is expressed as a probability distribution over models. Every model defines a precise way that the bandits respond to your actions. Uh, and if you think about it, every time you make an action and you observe a new reward, this changes your belief. So when you try and solve this maximization problem, in effect, what you're doing is you're solving a planning problem in the space of possible experiments as possible outcomes of the experiments, as well as the corresponding beliefs. You can think of it as a tic-tac-toe game between you and nature, right? Where you are making an experiment. So this is your tic-tac-toe board, right? You're making an experiment, and then nature responds with some outcome, okay? So you're making an experiment. Nature responds with some specific outcome. You're making another experiment. The same experiment, it could be a different outcome, right? But your model tells you what's the probability of every outcome. Uh, corresponding to uh, yeah, so even though you might not know the correct model, you might think that there are two possible models, two possible types of nature, and on average you get this outcome twenty percent of the time and this one eighty percent of the time. But then when you observe the outcome, that gives you some information about what nature is like, and you can put that in your posterior distribution. So here you have some initial belief about what's going to happen. When something actually happens, you do have a belief that it's a new one or this one, depending on what happens. Right. So after you have done that, then you can basically forget about the rest of the tree in reality. But when you are planning about what to do, you should always think about uh, the rest of the tree. So let's take an example. That doesn't even if you have a one-stage problem where you only design one experiment, you can still do this kind of analysis and say, okay, let's say I want to study whether or not smoking causes cancer. One way to do it is to say, okay, I will randomly assign some people to smoke, okay, and some people not to smoke. Yeah? <laughs> not good. Uh, so, you could do that, of course, but then you say, okay, well, how many people should I assign to the trial? One, ten, million? Right. Okay. How many people should smoke compared to not smoking? All right. okay. It actually depends on the model, right? So, let's say that you have two possible models. That might be true. What you can do is you say, okay, I will generate data from one model according to one policy for collecting data. And at the end, you get the result. And the result could be, it's inconclusive, it's conclusive, but a thousand people dead, okay? So it could be many different results. But for every policy and every possible model you could think of, you could have an evaluation, okay? So what you would like to do is to have the average uh, value for a specific policy, given that you don't know the model yet, but given you have a way of generating data from every possible model. And this is what you're basically doing here. Here you're saying, okay, I make an experiment that are a million possible models. On average, if I do this experiment, I get something like this. Yeah. Or I could get a bunch of different things. things. And the probability of getting 
this other time on average is something else. And you can continue going as long as you like. But even for the one step experiment, uh, there is already some work that you could do to prepare yourself for collecting the data. Uh, so how do you decide how many data to collect? How do you assign treatments to people? Even if it's only one shot, there's still you know, a question of what is the optimal way to collect data in the first place, right? Another application which is very important is active learning. So you no longer have classification of algorithms, but usually they require label data to work, even though there are some methods that can take advantage of non-label data, you sometimes will get more labels. Yeah. So one idea is active learning. You say, okay, this, is, this example, I'm not sure what to label it, how to label it, so I should ask a human how to do it. So if you say you have a million examples, you want to find the optimal design for selecting which experiment, which example to show the humans to get labels for, right? So it's another type of experimental design. You can do this in a one-shot process where you just assign randomly examples to people, for, for example, or you can do it in an iterative process where you select some examples, you give to them to get labels, and you select more examples based on the results you got from the previous ones and get more labels. Yeah. So these are all experiment design problems. And lots of the literature on classical experiment design focuses on one or two stage uh, designs. Uh, but if we're talking about completely autonomous systems, you can think about arbitrary uh, length experiments. Yeah. So two of the classical, not classical, two of the classical algorithms that work very well for the uh, sequential problem with long designs, but which actually have a format that doesn't look ahead in the future very much is the upper confidence bound algorithm and the Thompson sampling algorithm. So both of them deal with a case where you are indefinitely maximizing expected rewards over time, so that you think the sum of rewards over time. It's a simple enough thing to maximize. And the first algorithm basically constructs a confidence interval that looks at the average reward you get for every action and adds a little bounded. Okay? And the second algorithm assumes that you have some prior distribution over parameters, then samples from this parameter distribution and acts as though this parameter was true. Yeah. Now, neither of these algorithms is doing any complicated planning. Uh, they are very simple. Uh, so let's see how well do they actually perform. Okay. Uh, it's like an exercise. So laptops, please. So in the directory called something something, let's see. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this one's not there. So the first algorithm you uh, suggested was this average planet algorithm. Let me just make the font bigger. Okay. And I think it was Alex that suggested this algorithm. And the idea was that you calculate the average reward that you get from every arm, right? And then you estimate action probabilities that are proportional to the average reward of every arm, okay? So if an action has uh, given you a good reward nine times out of 10, and the other one given you a good reward one time out of 10, then you play the first one with 90% probability. 
that's the idea of this uh, algorithm. Okay, so I made a small test bench as well called bunny test. Um, you don't have this one yet, so let's comment it out. I do have them, so uh, I can plot them. But let's see this one. Okay, so the average pose should work. So, can somebody think of a reason why the average policy algorithm might not work? Uh, or what might be a drawback for it? So let's say you have two arms, okay? And let's say that this one has theta 0 is 0 0.6, theta 1, and then theta 2 is 0 0.4, okay? Let's say you play, initially your average reward, well, uh, it's not defined, but let's say it's 1. So you have to first define what's the average reward, right? You haven't played anything yet. So let's say to 1, just to have something. Okay? Um, that's okay. Let's say if you play the first arm, uh, then the probability 40% and you get a zero, right? Okay. So let's say a time so t equal one. You play uh, arm one and you get a reward of zero. Uh, there's a probability for, for getting a zero. It's quite high. Now, before, our averages were 1-1 uh, one, one because we didn't play them before. Okay. So at step, at step 2, this guy will have an average of 0. Right. The average of this other guy will be 1. Okay? So, at time step 2, we will definitely play action 2, right? Yeah. Now, if you get a zero, then this one also becomes a zero. Yeah, that's okay. Um, then we still have a chance of playing the, the first one. If you get a one, which again is kind of high probability, then the average of this one will become one and then it will stay larger than zero forever. Yeah? So then for step three, we'll have action two for sure, be this one. And then no matter if you get a zero or not, then this one becomes 0 0.5, 0 0.25, or whatever, but the first one will, will stay zero. Yeah. So, so this sometimes will happen. Yeah. So let's see, how well do we do? Uh, let's just remove this stuff. Uh, remove this part. And this should still work, I hope. Where did I set up the result? Oops, that's the wrong thing. A linear average result, okay. So this is how you get if you just plot a cumulative sum. Uh, but let's look at this. Okay, so this is the average performance we get over, uh, I don't know how many trials, uh, one trial, okay? It's not many trials, uh, but 10,000 steps. And in this scenario, there are only two arms, okay? And I didn't specify exactly how the data generated, but here I created Bernoulli bandit, which basically randomly selects the parameters for the two bandits, according to for, for the n bandits, and then randomly returns uh, the reward, okay? So, this seems to work kind of okay, although if you see it, maybe it doesn't really converge. 
mm, it's not quite clear if you make the number of actions higher 16 yeah it doesn't seem to learn a lot but we're not quite sure uh, anyway there could be a way to fix this yeah maybe we can compare this with a slightly different policy okay so what i did here was instead of using the average directly and um, i basically add a parameter in the beginning that puts fake counts in your uh, in your observations so even though you haven't observed anything you behave as though you have observed a one a few times it's similar to placing a beta prior over the uh, over the average reward of every arm okay so you can make this higher and then when you make this higher you will observe that uh, your uh, algorithm is slightly more optimistic and takes a different action a few more times so maybe it will work better maybe not yeah. let's see if this works no something strange why it didn't work Average policy. Ah, oh, yeah, no way. So we are a bit more optimistic. Doesn't seem to help a lot, right? Uh, if we don't this at all. Again, this is the result. This is the result of one experiment, so it could be different depending on how you do it. Yeah. So in one case, we are not optimistic at all, right? We're just looking at the average. Yeah. In the other case, we are a bit more optimistic, so we're playing much more often every other action because we have added fake counts. So that means we have to play an action a lot of times to be sure that it's uh, not very good. Okay. Then the results also depend on how long you play for, right? So I expect that it will be different if you play for a hundred steps or a thousand steps or ten thousand steps. Uh, so. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. I would expect that this works kind of okay. Uh, why isn't why? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, in this particular scenario, you see that uh, the one that is more optimistic doesn't get stuck playing a suboptimal arm, basically, while this one gets stuck in a suboptimal estimate. So, while there are some algorithms that are actually performing very well in these kind of problems, there is a difficulty, and a difficulty, well, difficulty, um, a lot of these results are mainly interesting for slightly for relatively large values of, uh, of experiments and not for very short experiments for shorter experiments you probably would be advised to use an algorithm that is doing more complicated planning yeah. but still this is not really the optimal algorithm because this is just a heuristic that we just constructed now right yes in the previous problem you have a 10 times 9 yeah Yeah, he, this one is not here, yeah. Now it works, so. Yeah, just a different problem. So uh, randomness makes things different. So if you want really to evaluate these kind of algorithms, then one run is definitely not enough. It's like more like a thousand runs to see which one is better on average. But this is in general for any experiment design problem because you really don't know what data you're going to get and where your data will be generated from. Uh, you have a disadvantage there, right? you need to generate a lot of data and see how the algorithm behaves under different data regimes in order to be say, okay, this is a good experiment design to use. And it's important to do it, especially when the actual data collection process is very costly 
then you should really spend time doing experiments with fake data in effect to see how well the analysis will be how good your analysis will be when you test it on real data so if you know you'll, you you can collect data from a thousand people and it will be of a particular form with a million futures or whatever and you're going to plan to do an analysis first you should see that if the data behaves the way you would like and you collect it so you generate it the way you, you expect it to be generated then you try and use your models to predict something does your model give you interesting results does the model agree with the way you generate the data in the first place no. and if you know what the model might be then it's easy if you don't really know what the model might be then it's a bit more complicated because you have to also generate different models yeah. so this is Bernoulli bandit now do you want to try and implement uh, I will go through a, a second idea, a softmax bandit. Softmax bandit just changes one thing. Uh, instead of just looking at the average reward, it exponentiates the average reward. And it has this parameter beta. So when beta is zero, then you're very random. And when it's infinite, then you select the arm with the highest reward all the time. Yeah. So you have an extra tuning parameter. Okay. And this might work better, might not work better. I mean, there is no... Neither of these algorithms is, is known to be optimal uh, for any setting of this uh, beta parameter here. So we cannot get uh, bounds for their performance relative to the oracle that knows the parameters beforehand. Uh, but softmax is okay, and uh, at least with softmax we know that eventually we will converge to the right values for the average reward because we will play every arm infinitely often. But on the other hand, even when we know the actual values of the arms, we will still play the suboptimal arms all the time. Hmm. So even if we know that theta one is 0 0.6 and theta two is 0 0.4 have converged to the right values will still play uh, them quite a lot right yeah and the same goes for the average algorithm even if you know that the first parameter is 0 0.6 and the second is 0 0.4 you still play the first one six percent of the time so that's a problem you would like to play the f if you know that's the first second or the, the second you have to play the first more much more all the time in the end okay so Let's go through the Thompson algorithm. How does it go? Um, you need to have some way of generating samples, okay, uh, from your model. And you need to have a model. Okay, so for this simple example, we already know a model, mm, better than known, right? So why don't you take the skeleton of the average reward bandit and try and do uh, a quick implementation of Thompson something? So how do this works, right? First, um, well, you observe. You should put and uh, add new observations uh, well, it uses new observations to change posterior parameters okay and in take action recommend you should basically uh, sample from a theta and find action maximizing theta i right okay so these are all in 
number of arms. Okay. So I think in my implementation it should be pretty okay. So let's try this. Source max policy. Yeah. So this is an example of the Thompson policy. Uh, the other two get stuck, basically playing some optimal arms. If your rewards are kind of not close to one on average, then they will just keep playing uh, some optimal arms quite a lot. Uh, or just make, maybe unlucky. It could be that one parameter is 0 0.9, but you're just unlucky and you sample it once and you get a zero, then you probably stop playing it forever. Or for a very long time. Okay, so then I will add it if it's not there. I don't have a network. Okay. Uh, what happened to my network? Hello. Well, start the implementation of the average bandit, then I will give that to you. Is there an Ethernet cable? Mm -hmm. No. Nope. 